uh, introducer and presenter is um, Beatrice Zanatelli, who is the founder and CEO of a really cool company called Light Touch, an amazing platform that helps families and educators identify the emotional intelligence related aspects that need to be addressed um, in a child's context. So pretty ambitious work. Beatrice, welcome. Hello, okay, hi. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm Beatrice Zanatelli, co-founder of Light Touch, and one of LATAM startup's SUV companies, and also the advisor of one of LATAM's newest sponsor called Ushark. Ushark makes investing in startups accessible to everyone. Ushark is a reference to an online investment fund, fund platform financed by crypto that was created to make investments in angel and seed startups throughout the world. We have a democratic environment that allows people to invest in startups starting at $100, and Ushark is one of the, rest, the, the, the rare SEC-approved uh, crypto projects in the world. And now I'm going to be introducing uh, Diego Sibbles, which is part of, he's a head of conversational uh, AI and Technicis. Uh, in February 2022, uh, Sophie Technologies acquired Technicis, a leading cloud-based core banking system in all stock transaction valued at approximately $1.1 billion. Previously, Technicis acquired Kona, a conversational AI-powered innovator in the banking industry from Uruguay. Throughout the acquisition, Technicis planned to expand its next-gen digital and core banking platforms, cap capabilities, and further redefine the customer experience. Now, about Diego Sibbles. Diego Sibbles is a tech entrepreneur former co-founder and CEO of, of Kona, with over 20 years in the technology sector. He has been a developer and manager for many years in both small startups and large corporations. He currently leads conversational banking at AI and Technicis, a banking uh, software maker. Uh, in 2015, Diego co-founded Kona, and now one of the newest LATAM startups, a uh, former, well, good friend of mine, please, the stage, Diego Sibbles. Good morning. Welcome. So I'm Diego, and I'm the CEO and founder of Kona. So today, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, this is not a nice story, but I think it's a great one. And that story is about how we didn't die, how we were able to survive the many stages of a startup, and we ended successfully reaching our objective. But that was not easy. And the reason that it's not easy is because 90% of the startups, they die the first year. So that's a big number. So there's this huge thing called the valley of death. That's us, 2015, my business partner and I, our first office, a lot of energy, a lot of dreams, a lot of things to do. So we were working at this consulting firm, and we said, let's be CEO and CTO. Let's be our own bosses. Let's have freedom, and let's be rich. Well, that was very far away. And we're very dumb when I see that in retrospective. Like, we didn't have any plan. We didn't have any business canvas or market strategy. We just had ambition. And, you know, we, and also, we didn't have any actual money, no investment. This is 2015. That means in Uruguay, there was no VC money available. So either you had a you know, family money, or friends and family money, uh, or just your own savings. So we used our savings for at least two years. So we started out creating products for developers. So we are developers. We 
we thought that we could create a product that developers can use and pay for. So at this co-working space, we spent at least two years. And in these two years, we generated zero money. So like zero revenue. Um, we started developing products. We didn't uh, have a strategy. We just you know, iterated over products and products. And we become you know, one of those startups that were you know, ready to quit. And that's because there's this thing called the Valley of Death. Now, this is a Y Combinator uh, concept, and you can look it up. <clears throat> so when a startup, when you have an idea, you have this development process where you have zero revenue or even negative cash flow. So that means that unless you make money, you die. Because you need to pay your bills, you need to eat, you need to survive. So we were in this stage. We were actually dying. We didn't have any money at all, but we were trying to come up with ideas on how to survive the valley of death. So once you get into that market fit and scaling, you are good to go. But reaching that stage is really hard. And most companies, that 90% number that I was talking about, they die here in this valley. That is why it's so hard to get through that. So we need to come up with a plan. And as I said, Uruguay, 2015, 2016, VC money is not a thing. I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't know how to ask for money. So we were like in real trouble. So we created this plan. And this plan was our master plan. Let's sell services to make money. Then development services. We are developers, we can code, we can sell our hours, and then we can make some money to survive. Then use that money to create products. Those products will then generate a recurring revenue that we can live on. That recurring revenue then will lead to a profit and potentially an exit. So instead of just going out and raising money, we did that to survive. So st we started selling our uh, development hours, and then we started making some money. And with that money, we were able to you know, barely survive and pay our bills and keep on working on products. But the interesting thing is that we never lose focus that we wanted to be a products company, not a services company. Because we knew that we, we, you have a product and you own the IP, the intellectual property, then you can sell it. If you sell services, what you have is just the hours that you are selling. So you're worth what your hour is worth. So with a product, your multiply uh, when you sell your company would be much higher. So we never lose focus about the product thing. So what we did, it was we sat on coffee shops one weekend every month to create what we called weekend MVPs. That means we needed to build an MVP once a month that we could potentially sell to someone. This is us working at a coffee shop in Montevideo. And in this weekend MVP, we focused on AI. We wanted to be an AI company. We just didn't know, you know what product do we create. So in this case, we created a chatbot, basically a chatbot that you can talk to and get replies really fast using machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. So this weekend MVP led us to a hackathon. This hackathon was a bank organized hackathon that you know anyone could join and create a new and interesting product or project, um, and then you'll get five thousand dollars if you win. So using this experience, we joined into this hackathon organized by the largest bank in, in Uruguay. Um, it happened 
that we won the hackathon. So we created the first banking chatbot in Uruguay. So that led to something very interesting that happened afterwards, that the bank actually bought the project, the product from us. So that's kind of amazing. So we had our first customer. So the first customer was this large bank that is now using our product. It wasn't a product, it was an MVP, really, really bad MVP, but it worked. It showed the bank that they can have a chatbot and get replies in less than three seconds to customers. Very simple questions. So once we got the first customer, what I said was, we can sell this, right? So we can sell this to more banks. That's what I said. If this bank needs it, I'm guessing every other bank will need it as well. Again, no business plan, no product market strategy, nothing. I didn't know what that was at all. <clears throat> so what I did was what I had an idea of talking about chatbots. And I went all the way around the world to talk about how chatbots will transform the banking industry. So this is in China, in Shanghai. I signed up on the Mobile World Congress speakers. I got accepted. I bought a plane ticket to China. And I was able to talk about how chatbots are transforming the banking industry, meaning a creating a conversational channel. You can now talk to banks over a chatbot, over a voice channel, or even a text channel, as if you were talking to a bank executive. So I went to China, I went to uh, California, Argentina, Barcelona, to talk about chatbots. We had money to buy the tickets, so I could fly over there, because we were selling services, and I was talking about, and just talking about chatbots all the time. So I spent two years talking about chatbots everywhere. In every single spot that I had the opportunity to talk about this, I was saying chatbots are coming. So that, interestingly, led to banks calling us, saying, hey, I like what you're saying. Can you come and show me what you have? And in this same conference in China, there was a Chilean uh, person there that was representing a Chilean bank. And when I got off stage, he told me, hey, I like what you're saying. Can you fly to Chile to show us what, you, what the product does? So I did that as well. And interestingly, we signed our second contract in Chile for this product, which we call Connecta. So the interesting thing about all this is we were selling services. Our product was really small. One customer, two customers, and we were just talking about, talking about chatbots and letting everyone know that we were the ones that knew a lot about that technology. And this is, again, 2015, 2016, 2017. Chatbots weren't really that great. Now they are much better. But we were actually pioneering that technology. So, Fast forward, 2019, we said we are ready for North America. We had like four customers, by the way, five customers. But they were big banks. We had some big name banks already. So that, it was picking up, but we were still selling services to survive. So the product business didn't meet our uh, needed budget for the year. So we were still selling services. So now, I came to Toronto and I, said, I went to Collision Conference, that's me and my brother. I hired my brother to be at the booth and just capture people. Like, hey, everyone that goes through or even nearby, just, you know, capture it. So <laughs> I, because he lives in San Francisco, so he flew uh, over to Toronto, and I pitched him right away what the product was, and he was capturing leads, and we got a, few interesting leads from that collision uh, conference, which is happening very soon as well. And then we met Miriam, uh, and we signed up for the startup uh, visa program. That 
That way, we could actually have a very fast entrance into the North American market through Toronto. I remember, we are in the banking industry. We have big banks here, Toronto Financial District. It was a great platform for us to go into the North American market. And what's interesting about this is that is one of the presentations that I was actually trying to understand what a product market fit strategy is. Because coming from Uruguay, we don't sell like that. In Canada, you need to sell differently. It's all about numbers. It's all about KPIs and how much money are you saving or how much money, more money are you making with this product. In Uruguay, I would say you need to have this. This is amazing. In Canada, it's like you will save 10% of your customer support costs and you will make 2% more money over a digital channel if you have our product. And that was something that I learned by being here and living here for a while, is that in Canada, you know, they trust your platform works. You just sh need to show the numbers, like how it's better than the other platform from your competition. So we deal that. I spent several months here in the Toronto winter, which was interesting. And then we, at the end, we signed up our first contract with a Canadian bank. That was amazing. That was like the moment that I was looking for. Because that meant that we were ready for the North American market. We're still, all my people was in, in Montevideo working and still selling services and else, but the product was actually picking up. And it was actually interesting for a Canadian company. So that meant, hey, if this is interesting for a Canadian company, then we have the North American market for us. Then we got some press about it. We got some press about how a Uruguayan company coming to Canada was able to sign a contract with a Canadian bank. And that got some attention from some companies. And one of those companies called us and said, hey, we are in the banking industry. We sell uh, the core. We sell also the digital side of the banks. We like your product. And you, if you are able to sell this product in Canada, coming from Uruguay, it must be good. I said, yeah, it's very good. Uh, you can check it out. So in a period of six months, this happened. We got an offer of acquisition, and we sold the company. This is all because of the product not because of the services. Our service business, it was all about making money to survive, to not to die. If we didn't do the service part, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. So we agreed on a transaction that was a mix of, um, you know, trans every transaction has uh, a stock and cash, so we said, we also want part of this company that is being acquired, that is acquiring us. Um, so the selling process was kind of hard because you need to convince your partner that selling is the best thing to do. And it's not always that easy because there's a lot of emotions, like we are selling our baby and you know what's going to happen afterwards is all going to be the same. Yeah, spoiler, it's not the same, but it is very interesting, the process of creating and selling your company. So we sold the company, we agreed to the transaction, and then we expected to be at least, let's say, five years afterwards. And then something interesting happened. Less than a year after that we got acquired, this happened. So SoFi is one of the biggest banks now in, in LATAM. So our company that was acquired got acquired. So we are now part of this other company, uh, of the umbrella company called SoFi. So the company that got acquired was valued at $1.1 billion. So we, it was a, obviously a, a, a great deal for everyone, but we never expected this to happen so soon. So 
The thing with surviving and believing is what I think is the most integral part of being a CEO and founder of a startup. That is, sometimes you only have the belief that you will make it. Not giving up where you don't have money to pay your bills, that's the hardest part. Some, some people say that uh, when, when the companies are uh, in that stage, founders quit and founders start to fight and they fall apart. And most of the companies, either they, they die because of the money or the founders that are quitting because they can't stand the, the, the vibe of the company or the status or, or, or the morale of the company. So we had no idea what we were doing. We knew that we have a team that could make great things, and we're two. We ended up being 50 people, but we're two people believing that what we had was a great strength in uh, our technical abilities and our uh, ideas. So I'm going to leave you with five takeaways that I think they work really well for us. Launch an imperfect MVP. When I say imperfect MVP, it's really imperfect. Like, it doesn't need to have a lot of features, just show value, show some value in the product. Our chatbot system or platform was made in two days. We showed it work, then we developed the product. This is so hard. Startups run on morale. Morale meaning if your founders are sad, they, the company will die if you can't keep that morale up. Either by people using your products, clients, or even your team. You as a CEO, as a founder, your job is to keep your clients happy and your team happy. Pivot as needed, and don't wait until it's too late. If you pivot too late, you will die as well. And the problem is sometimes you get caught into that innovation, that technology, and you realize it's, you know, you, it doesn't work, but it might be too late. So just pivot super quickly. And this, I learned about cash flow like two years into the company. I didn't know what cash flow was. If you don't have money, you can't pay your bills, you don't have any means to make money, you die as a company. So cash flow. Focus on the cash flow and not on the revenue. Revenue is for the books. Cash flow is what pays the bills every month. And last, please don't give up. At the end, uh, it will all work out well. So thank you very much.